Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. So, are you ready to get started? Hi, I'm very ready Hi. to get started. <laughs> We're here. We're here. We're in this. It's malpractice at nighttime. Malpractice at midnight. <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine? <laughs> we, no. <laughs> you joking? We'd both be like, whatever, this is it. I don't care anymore. <laughs> I-, I could never. Midnight is not our time. I'm an early bird, I am not a night owl. Except if you give Sydney a couple drinks, she will force you to stay awake. <laughs> well, that's correct. I am straight up a pusher. <laughs> You're like, oh, stay awake with me. <laughs> I was watching this show the other day. It's called Psych, the show. Have you ever seen it? Yes. I've seen some episodes. Okay. There's this one where they're at a bachelorette party and the chief of police is there and the woman was like, take a shot. And the the chief goes excuse me, I'm the chief of police. And the other woman goes, and I'm the chief of making bitches do shots. And Eric looked at me and he was like, that's you. Yeah. (laughs) And Eric is the chief of police. (laughs) Literally. He's the chief of picking us up off the floor. (laughs) Period. Have you guys put up your Christmas decorations? Oh, Christmas tree. Yes. Is your Christmas tree good? Yes, I like it. Mm -hmm. Do you guys do like all one type of decoration or do you have like a theme or do you just do random stuff? Yeah, we do. um, Ours is like gold and silver. That's cool. Yeah. That's what we do. I like coordination. Same. Um, You know me. When I was growing up, my parents had, uh, we always had like a go out and to the farm and cut down your own tree yeah right yeah but then we had it was like a chaotic christmas experience where Mm -hmm. there was like multicolored lights which i should have appreciated because gay but i didn't because (laughs) chaos chaos and then every ornament is totally different and there's no system and it was like macaroni strings that i had made Mm -hmm. when i was in preschool and i'm like i don't care about this anymore i throw in trash my parents straight up still have a three wise men ornament that i must have made it's out of popsicle sticks so i must have made it in elementary school for sure couldn't couldn't have been any later than like fourth grade. Oh, I was about to say separation of church and state, but you went to private school. <laughs> went to private to school, yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. That's correct. They did not separate that shit. Um like when I see my mom's tree, I'm like, it looks so homey because she has so many decorations. They're random and chaotic, but it's homey because there's so many of them. Yeah. Whereas our tree is basically like golden gold and silver kind of like yours yeah, love it and we had to buy plastic ornaments because we have cats right and if there's one thing that everyone in the world should know about a cat it's that as soon as you put the christmas tree up those bitches are up in that tree trying to knock mm-hmm. stuff down what do you want from them the first thing they do you get the tree out of the box they start chewing on it i'm not They're exaggerating like, oh about to get it (laughs) and then the ornaments we have to hang the all of the ornaments at least like three feet off the ground so the cats can't swing at them (laughs) oh my god (laughs) they've literally climbed up the tree and knocked it over before it's in their dna is it both cats it's both cats yeah so you can imagine the fat girl cat climbing up a target christmas tree (laughs) yeah She's like, this is my time. She's like, I'm in the jungle, bitch. This is my workout. (laughs) When in fact, she is not. And it's a mess. What else is new? I didn't realize how... Have you ever had this moment where you're like, I had a great day. I'm exhausted. Like, literally right after you're like, I love today. I will go to sleep right now. Every single day. (laughs) That's how I am. (laughs) I spent about 45 minutes on the phone with my cousin when I got off work today. I was like, you know, we were both going home. We were both on our little commutes or whatever. And we were just talking about the fact that begrudging the fact that we're not independently wealthy. Me, every day. (laughs) And we still have to continue going to work. And it's so rude. No, it is rude. I I find it disgusting. I'm just thankful sometimes I have a job. (laughs) Same. I should feel that way, but I don't. You know how sometimes people ask you, like, if you won the lottery, would you quit your job? 
And people are like, no, I would just live exactly the same. I'm like, absolutely not. No, I'd quit my job. How much is the lottery? I, you know, they're always like $800 million. Oh, yeah, I'm quitting. <laughs> I wouldn't think twice. People are like, oh, you wouldn't want to finish your PhD? And I'm like, mm, I don't need to be a doctor if I have $800 million. <laughs> I'll be, you I'll be whatever buy you want. A, I'll buy a doctorate. <laughs> Literally. Honorary doctorate at University of Me that I started with my $800 million. <laughs> I bet you'd make a big enough donation to a university they'd give you an honorary doctorate. They, they do that all the time. Would. They did they did it to Shaq. <laughs> He's a doctor. There you go. Dr. Shaq. Yeah. Just saying. That's a bop. That's a good idea, actually. If yeah. I had money, what? I'd do that. Winning the lottery? <laughs> Winning the lottery is a great idea. I mean, you gotta play to win, and I don't. You don't. <laughs> My dad does. You though. don't. I don't no. either. My dad plays the lottery and he calls me and he's like, hey, check these lotto numbers and see if we have to go to work on Monday. Aww. That's what he calls me every time. <laughs> and what does he ever win any? Yeah, he won. Um, He won like 50 bucks or something like that, which is, you know. That's lunch. Dinner. It's lunch. Dinner. Yeah. Pays for your Snacks. lottery tickets next week. <laughs> Period. You know, I, what I would say is like nobody should rely on the lottery. Like don't make that your plan A. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like a fun thing to... Are there people who it's their whole plan? Dude, I literally think that people like spend their paychecks on lottery tickets thinking like, I'm going to win if I play all these. Absolutely not, my friend. You are not. <laughs> are you okay? I also... They have an episode of Criminal Podcast where this guy worked for the lottery in one state, like the state, lo state lottery, and he rigged the numbers so that he won twice. And I was like... Dude, you probably could have gotten away with it. What? Yeah, why did you say anything? Why would you People do it get twice? greedy, man. People get so They get greedy. Greedy. How much do you need? Two, two lotto winnings? Absolutely not. Two? No. And you don't think they're going to check up on that? Yeah, no. You work you, there. You're the number one suspect, my guy. <laughs> they should have checked the first time. <laughs> I would be very suspicious. Same. It's also like any time you ever ran for anything in school, you couldn't count the ballots. You can't trust them. Can't trust me. I would definitely give... Can't. I would give myself what I wanted. Move on with my life. What? Two for me, one for you. <laughs> Two for me, one for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you don't understand my math doesn't mean the math is not here. Also, if you won a student body position, the joke is on you because you have to organize the class reunion. <laughs> Dude, the joke is so on me. Yeah. The jo I wish I had counted and made myself lose. <laughs> too popular for your own good was i i don't think i was very popular in high school <laughs> you were popular with me i was there <laughs> I, I know i was i was involved i was very involved in I high school i will involved. say that i would say you were cool i i think you were cool whatever i'm hanging out with you 10 years later <laughs> it was i'm i'm still glowing up right now <laughs> it was, i was not cool in high Believe school her. but i did sign up for everything <laughs> that is something i did <laughs> i feel like we were we were cool in our own circle we we whatever i don't give a fuck <laughs> I don't give a fuck either, but I was not cool. I got home and I drank a glass of wine and I honestly was going to finish that sentence and I just couldn't make myself do it. I don't give a fuck. Sometimes it'd be like that. Well, let me introduce our guest today then. Get into it. This is a great episode and I really like this interview. Same. Okay. Today we're bringing you an interview uh, with Tegan Kehoe. Tegan is a public historian, a museum curator, and a writer specializing in the history of healthcare and of science and society with a social history angle. So she's like pretty much one of the coolest people ever, which... Yeah, she's so cool. First of all, I didn't know this job existed. No, same. Second of all, to integrate the very two things that we also like to integrate, which is history... And medicine. It's a bop. Mm -hmm. She is currently an exhibit and education specialist at the Paul S. Russell MD Museum of Medical History and Innovation in Boston, which shout out to Boston. Boston doesn't get enough credit for being Boston. Totally agree. And she has a book coming out soon. So she's an author. Uh, it is called Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures. It's coming out in January of 2022. And we are going to um, you can pre-order it on Amazon. So we'll link that. 
in the notes. The other thing I'll say about her book is that she sent us some chapters so that we could do the interview and talk to her about the book a little bit. And I will say it is so fascinating because she bases the each single chapter is based on a yep. piece of like medical history that's like a physical object. And she talks about kind of the history of that object, how it was integrated into medicine, some of the problematic things that went along with that. Because as you know, like medical history has some has some shit to atone for. Yeah, it is really it's an interesting way to understand history. So 100%. especially people who are like, I want to know some more stuff about like the topics we really like about, but who don't want to spend an entire book on one topic. It's a really good, like right. short, sweet but also extremely descriptive way to get a lot of information about tons of different stuff. Totally. And she has such an interesting and unique perspective. Like the Mm -hmm. way that she words things and the topics that she chooses to spend time on are so cool and informative. And relevant. Um, Definitely go pre-order her book. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we're super hyped for her ovs. Uh, We're super excited to bring her to your ear holes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So with that, here's the interview. Welcome, Tegan. Welcome, Tegan. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Tegan Kehoe. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. And I am a public historian and museum professional and writer. Um, My day job, um, although day job is a little derogatory and I do love it, um, is exhibit and education specialist at the Russell Museum of Medical History and Innovation at the uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston. And um, I recently wrote a book, um, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures. And we will absolutely link that book in our show notes. Please go buy Tegan's book. It's really, really cool. (laughs) We've definitely read some chapters of it, and I'm so excited to read the rest. Yeah. So could you tell us how you got into this field of work? Sure. Um, So I got into history museums very intentionally and got into medical museums a little bit unintentionally. So I was interested in a career in history museums, um, started volunteering in some in college, Uh, started browsing course catalogs for what grad school in this field would look like. So I have a master's in history and museum studies. Um, And I always knew that I wanted to do things that involved both the curatorial and the education side. And jobs like that are a little bit hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And I also, among my many interests within history, had sort of a hobby interest in medical history. And after grad school, um, this position that I have now opened up um, that was both the exhibit side and the education side in a medical history museum. Um, And so I've been there about six years now and I've just been going deeper and deeper, you know, wrote a book and I'm continuing research on medical history topics. That's so cool. And your book, which is so cool, like the amount of people that I know that can say they've written a book is like (laughs) two and you're one of them. (laughs) Can you tell us why you chose to do that? Sure. So I've known that I wanted to write actually longer than I knew that I wanted to work in museums. And so I had been, you know, looking for an opportunity that, that I was actually qualified to write, because there are lots of books I would love to write where I wouldn't necessarily be a good person to be Mm. the one to write them. Yeah. And then I, and I, you know, had a couple of false starts and that sort of thing. But I saw this call for proposals from um, a professional organization in my field, the American Association for State and Local History. And they normally do books that are specifically aimed at people within the profession and volunteers, so people within the field. Mm -hmm. But this series is really for both people inside the museum world and people who just like museums. So it was a new thing for them. And they put out this call for book proposals on this theme of exploring a topic in 50 historic treasures, as they call them. So museum artifacts, historic sites around the country. Mm -hmm. And I thought about whether that would be a good fit for what's now my expertise, medical history. And I thought very much a good fit, especially because medical history is inherently visceral. It's 
tangible. It's stuff you can touch. Mm-hmm. It's stuff that even when you can't touch it, yeah. it can touch you when it's something like a microbe, when you, you know, viruses and bacteria can touch us, even if, yeah. if there isn't something tangible to put in a museum exhibit. <laughs> um, and so that's just a really good fit for talking about that history through the lens of material things. And so, yeah. you know, I wrote the proposal and they were interested and you know, from beginning to end, it was a couple year process. There was a lot of research. And if I write another book, which I definitely plan to, it will definitely not be on 50 different subjects. That was a lot. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but it was a fantastic experience. No, it's so cool. And the for our listeners in the book, Tegan has images of all of the different medical instruments and illustrations from from the time period, like they're so cool and so interesting. (laughs) And as kind of a history buff myself I was you know obsessed with it when you think about historical writing what kind of keeps you interested and engaged and what about specifically like medical history kind of drew you to maybe you've already answered this what kind of drew you to that topic sure um I think that for me and for a lot of people history is about stories Mm -hmm. um they're true stories but they're stories about what motivates someone or what problem they're trying to solve, Mm -hmm. what question they're trying to answer, kind of sometimes who they are as a person, what Mm -hmm. drives them. And sometimes you don't really know the stories. You don't really know the personal stories when you look at historical things, but you can get at some collective stories, even if you don't know, you know, oh, these two people who were research partners didn't get along personally. You might not know that kind of backstory but you know Mm -hmm. solving this problem had a big societal effect or was supposed to but didn't yeah Uh, one Mm -hmm. of my favorite chapters to research was the one on alternative medicine in the 19th century Mm -hmm. where much of what was being done doesn't hold up to the scientific standards of today much of it didn't hold up to the scientific standards of the time yeah but (laughs) yeah um, the, the artifact itself is a, a bottle of um, Hostetter's Celebrated Stomach Bitters. That was the name with celebrated in the name. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to cure all kinds of GI distress. Um, and it was basically an alcohol with some herbal tincture. Okay. It, it didn't really do anything. Cool. But they were marketed as an alternative when yeah. a lot of scientific medicine wasn't really scientific yet either. It was um, yeah a lot of mercury pills, a lot of bloodletting, right. um, a lot of cocaine. Yes, yes, <laughs> actually, also, there's predates cocaine, um, but but there is a chapter on cocaine as well. Oh, cool. And yeah, and you get that sort of thing when you're looking at medical history of oh that predates cocaine, and let's talk about the beginnings of cocaine and yeah, which was actually the first successful local anesthetic in addition to being yeah you know, a very dangerous drug. Um, And so that has its own story. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah, I think that the personal stories, but also there are fascinating stories, even when they're not personal. And that's one of Mm -hmm. the things I really like about it. Yeah, that's so cool. And our some of my favorite topics that we've covered have included things like this era when you know, we did it. We did an episode, and there's a chapter in your book. I think about opioids, right? And kind of learning that in the early 1900s, they were just like, "Oh yeah, your you know your liver hurts. Did you try heroin?" <laughs> right. It's like now we think about that, and you're like, "Why would anyone do such a thing?" But at mm-hmm. the time, it's kind of all they had. Yeah. Right. And they just did what they could. Right. Right. And a, a pain medication that's extremely potent that was see- seen as wildly successful yeah because they didn't have anything that potent before and so not knowing enough about the side effects not knowing enough about the addictive properties it was based on what they knew at the time it was excellent 100 percent, yeah yeah and the course of the 20th century is really when we start to see changes in requirements well the existence of requirements and then changes of requirements of medical testing and testing medications and making sure that your studies are scientifically rigorous. Some of that had been going on before the 20th century, but it wasn't mandated until the 20th century. Yeah. And so 
while there are still absolutely things that go wrong in medicine, either through lack of knowledge or through malfeasance, on, often on the part of the big corporations that are involved. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that drugs don't hurt anyone anymore, but we don't have nearly as many of those. Oh, we just didn't know about that problem for decades while millions of people were using this. Right. Um, because of those regulations, we don't have nearly as much of that anymore. Yeah. Well, I love your mention of like telling the stories. When I first started <laughs> teaching Texas history, mm-hmm. I, would start every class like, okay, let me tell you a story. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure they thought the entire class was fiction. I literally <laughs> literally yeah. was like, let me just tell you a story. And I would take tests about the story. But we want to give you the space to really talk through maybe your top three um, topics in your book. And, you know, I think you have so much to share information wise. So we'll let you kind of start roaming free and in your educational space here we're just captive listeners so go go crazy we're okay yeah. with it that's 100%. welcome here all right well thank you so i i cannot choose my top three because i probably have 20 <laughs> favorite stories from this book of 50 stories um, but i do <laughs> we'll make it a series yeah. we'll just keep interviewing you <laughs> Um, but I, I did pick three that I can relate to one another. Awesome. Um, and so they, they kind of tell a bigger story in addition to their own stories. Um, and that bigger story is really about the medical establishment and people, influential people within the medical establishment, um, making decisions on who's worthy of receiving care and what type of care. Um, so one of the artifacts in my book is a craniometer, meaning, um, a measurement tool, kind of a set of calipers for measuring a human skull. Um, These are still in use today. Um, Things like when you Mm -hmm. determine whether a newborn's head is in the, you know, 50th percentile of newborns or the 90th percentile, that sort of thing. You're taking human measurements. The field of anthropometry, which is where this craniometer fits into, you know, has some useful and benign applications, including up through today. But you can tell by the fact that I'm saying this is still used and there are benign applications that what I'm about to say is not a benign application. (laughs) Um, Because so the craniometer was invented um, as a way of measuring heads in order to tell things about people. Mm -hmm. And those things, well, it wasn't accurate, but it gets worse from there. Yeah. So uh, phrenology, you may have heard of, or you may have seen those those busts. They're kind of popular as reproductions. It was the study of determining, and that's in quotes, uh, things about people's personality and their character by examining the bumps on their head. Um, this sort of hit its peak at about the 18 teens to 1840s, um, and it was a pseudoscience, but it was practiced by a wide range of people from people that would be kind of easily recognized as engaging in pseudoscientific endeavors, you know, people who are basically traveling showmen. Um, And also it was embraced by some people who had been kind of legitimized through the medical school system and were official doctors. Um, It actually did have influence on early psychology and neurology and the concept that different areas of the brain have right yeah different functions that was kind of inspired by phrenology but phrenology itself was never there was no accuracy in it right if you're a medical doctor practicing something that you also can see at a carnival reevaluate yes definitely although actually We'll come back to that because there's a, oh no, a point is there a good the thing? Stories. <laughs> yes, um, okay. but I think that that's um, it was a pretty unique circumstance, okay. um, and I think that overall your rule definitely stands. I think that <laughs> you know people should never take medical advice from podcasts or from historians, but uh, yeah, but that one, if it's at a carnival, it's probably a good rule. Um, yeah, thank you. But, we like to make wild accusations here. Yeah, yeah. We do. <laughs> so, so that was one thing you could do with a craniometer was measure someone's head for this. Phrenology sometimes played into stereotypes. You know, mm-hmm. a particular practitioner might say that 
a man's intelligence head bump was greater than a woman's intelligence head bump. Um, there was, you know, racism and stuff in there too, but it wasn't a system codifying or promulgating racism. But mm -hmm. what overlapped with it and came afterwards absolutely was. Um, so the, the field of scientific racism was a school of thought within medicine and within um, anthropology and kind of any field that's studying the human body or studying humans as a group and dividing people into races. Mm -hmm. Normally today, we don't talk about medicine as a field that divides people into races, but it was a big, big thing in the, the 19th century. So a scientist named um, Anders Retzius created what he called the cephalic index, which was um, a way of quantifying how round or how tall your head is. So whether it's mm -hmm. wider than it is tall or taller than it is wide and where it is in kind of the gradation between that. And he assigned those to racial categories. Those assignments were messy, but mm -hmm. at least they had some grounding in fact. But you can kind of see where this is going. The reason that he wanted to do that was so he had a quantifiable way of how civilized a person or a race was, how, it, yeah. how advanced they were, that sort of thing. So that was one of the first quantifiable changes in scientific racism, where it was really, all right, we're scientists and we believe that white people are the best. And so we're going to figure out a way to put that on paper. Yeah. And so throughout the 19th century into the 20th century, this was a really big part of both medical research and anthropological research. Mm -hmm. um, you saw a number of medical museums being formed, um, some part of the US government that were collecting specimens of human beings, pretty much entirely against those human beings well. Um, and when I say specimens, I mostly mean human remains. I don't mean living people. There were touring exhibits um, that included living people, yeah. usually either without their consent or in an extremely exploitative situation. Um, but these collections that were created for scientific study mm. were really used again and again to reinforce these same racist ideas. Right. A lot of the collecting practices were grave robbing, um, but grave robbing is mild compared to, oh, well, we're also engaged in wars against a number right. of different Native American nations right now. Why don't we have soldiers bring back the bodies when they're done killing people Ugh. or uh, robbing graves that are being protected by armed guards? And if you kill the guard, oops. So these really um, brutal and dehumanizing practices yeah. where dehumanizing was really kind of the point. Um, the point was separating people out. And especially when it came to Native peoples, right. U.S. government and scientific authorities at the time were really invested in this quote-unquote vanishing Indian narrative in which the idea was mm -hmm. we're not committing genocide this group of people is just vanishing they're constitutionally weaker um, Native American groups right uh, yeah were more susceptible to certain diseases epidemic diseases in the 19th century largely because those diseases were attacking people with insecure housing, um, poor access to health care, uh, trauma. And if they are right. being moved across the country forcibly, if they are under literal attack, if there's warfare going on, mm -hmm. you know, today we call those social determinants of health. Right. So yes, Native Americans were dying of tuberculosis faster than other people were dying of tuberculosis. But right, it didn't right. make, mean that they deserved to die faster right. than others. The idea of like a, a population vanishing is so passive when you're actively perpetrating these things. Right. If you're yeah. forcing a group of people to live in poverty, to, to live under um, really horrible conditions, they're going to be more susceptible to, to things. Um, Mm -hmm. So I want to switch gears, but at first it's not going to sound like I'm switching gears um, because one of the other topics in the book is eugenics, which was the, well, is um, the system of belief within science and social science. Mm -hmm. First of all, that uh, what 
characteristics in people are inheritable is very important. And second of all, that you can improve society by choosing what genes future generations get. Yeah. Um, and by extension, it's also choosing who deserves to live longer, who deserves to have access to medical care, and so on. So some people um, say that something cannot be considered eugenics unless it's talking about the gene pool and further generations. But eugenic thought really exists within how people are treated within their own lifetimes as yeah. well. No, 100%. Uh, one of the sort of predecessors to this was this um, 18th century theory that it would be just a impossible, it would be against natural law for food supply to ever outpace population growth. Just the population is always going to grow faster than we can feed people, and therefore there will always be poor people. And therefore, it's not helping anyone if you help poor people, because apparently poor people aren't anyone. Mm gross yeah very gross we hate to see it <laughs> we <Yeah>. hate it <laughs> um and so yeah. this theory stuck around even though it's been disproven many times because there have been many times when food supply outpaces population growth but also this quote-unquote logical progression from there are, there will always be poor people to and thus poor people don't deserve help that's not provable but it's also just yeah. wrong. I mean, there's an ethical issue with it, a really big one. Yeah. But eugenics combined this passion for the science of genetics that was going on in the late 19th century with this idea of that it's important to help society, but the way you do that is by lifting up the people who are already successful. Because if they're successful, hmm. they must be doing something right. They must be constitutionally, okay. genetically doing something right yeah so the artifact in my book that's related to this is a medal from a fitter family's pavilion at a state or county fair and fitter families contests were like livestock contests except mm -hmm. they were for humans and they were for human families and people were judged on whether they had normal or superior genetic qualities a side note to this, one of the other common things in sort of the heyday of eugenics from the late 19th century up to about the 1930s is this obsession with the idea of heritable traits. Right. And so lots and lots of things that today we know cannot be inherited, or we know mm, maybe there's a genetic component, but it's really complicated. They were considered absolutely black and white heritable traits. Yeah. So intelligence. Um, kindness, patriotism, criminality, all of these different things, good and mm -hmm. bad, mm -hmm. were considered genetic. And these, in addition to having these contests where the winners were told that they were of good stock and that they should breed a lot, and the losers were told that they should not breed and not marry if they hadn't already, because marriage leads to breeding. <laughs> That's so stressful. Why would you enter that competition? <laughs> no, yeah. I would never want that kind of feedback in my life. <laughs> also, how as a family do you decide to do that? Like, okay, kids, everybody pee in your cups. We're going to go take this <laughs> to the state fair. Yeah. Right, right. No, thank you. But it was it was very normalized at the time. I read some newspaper coverage of these fairs. Yeah. And it was it was like the newspaper was reporting on a high school football game. And I think I even made that observation in the chapter about it. it was just. Oh, my God. It was very, very normalized. People were excited about this idea. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, today at a county fair, you might swing the comically large hammer at the, the thing that tells you whether you're a strong man and, and people do it because it's fun to think that they might be good at it. Yeah. And I think that that was part of it. People who already knew that they were going to get at least average points in this kind of thing because eugenics was not some brand new idea that had completely different sets of prejudices from the rest of society. No, it was healthy, able-bodied white people mm -hmm. who were doing well in these competitions. Right. So people who already thought that they might do okay right. were inspired. Which is gross. Yeah. Which is super gross. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think a lot of them didn't think they were hurting people 
um, didn't think that eugenics was hurting people, but definitely didn't think that they were hurting people by participating in this. Right. Um, and they weren't necessarily directly, but the indirect effect of mm-hmm. letting this continue to be this big phenomenon absolutely hurt people. Right. It's really hard to talk about this part because it sounds like hyperbole, but the Nazis got a lot of their ideas from American eugenicists. Yeah. They moved faster on them. That American eugenicists did. They sterilized a lot more people a lot quicker, but American eugenics societies were influencing the sterilization of yep. um, prisoners and inmates in mental health institutions up through the 1970s at least. Um, that's when there's a lot of documentation. I don't know that it necessarily ended then. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Nazis used race based justifications for murder that were never implemented on on a government scale here. But, you know, eugenics absolutely harms people. No, 100%. Yeah. Um, There were instances of doctors promoting infanticide for disabled or mixed race babies in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of them got some pretty positive press coverage about that. Um, And so that's why I want to say that the U.S. never murdered people out of eugenics on a government scale. Mm -hmm. But on an individual scale, there was some of it that went on and and I don't even know if the extent of it is documented. Yeah. I mean, if anything that you did heavily influenced Nazis. You messed up. You messed up. Probably want to consider that a, <laughs> an error. Right, right. Yeah. And after World War II, a lot of Americans started to distance, distance themselves from eugenics. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them put that distance in what I would consider to be the wrong place just from an ethical standpoint, okay. um, they would say, oh, we practice positive eugenics. We try to encourage healthy, normal, good people to breed rather than discouraging mm-hmm. abnormal, tainted, their words, wow. uh, people from breeding. We're not sterilizing people, we're incentivizing people. Okay. And that kind of language of like positive versus negative eugenics had existed before the war, before the Nazis, but that was one of the ways that they justified it to themselves and to each other. Yeah. Lots of times in scientific history, in my experience and what I've heard, because I'm a, so I'm in a neuroscience PhD program. And um, with that, a lot of what I do is behavioral biology. Mm. A lot of neurobehavioral biologists don't necessarily have the best backgrounds with eugenics. It's not really a secret. It's something that I think the field is coming to terms Mm. with and atoning for now for the first time maybe ever with the new generation of scientists coming in. But it's like Mm -hmm. one of the members of my committee was not trained by but was trained by someone who was outright a eugenicist. James Watson of the famous Watson and Crick Mm -hmm. duo is a eugenicist and has been stripped of titles for being a eugenicist, like, Mm -hmm. unabashedly. And I think it's really interesting to hear your take on the medical history of, like, where they're they're placing the the distance in the wrong part, right? They're like, oh, well, we'll, we're just encouraging, like, positive breeding. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're saying, like, the breeding of humans, you're probably Mm -hmm. dabbling in eugenics. Yeah. Yeah. At least you're eugenic eugenics adjacent at the minimum Feels that way. <laughs> you're right yeah, there you're definitely. on the cusp you should stop <laughs> yeah. and if you're if you're breeding for selected characteristics yeah. which is you know when you start calling it breeding rather than just having kids yep. correct then you're you're making some kind of value judgment about those characteristics and i think that that's the other thing that makes makes eugenics eugenics mm-hmm. is that um you know in the heyday of eugenics it was mm-hmm. People were really excited about the ways that science could contribute to society. This was kind of the tail end of the progressive era. There were a lot of new scientific innovations. Germ theory was pretty new. You know, there were a lot of great things happening and people were saying, yes, science can make the world better. Science can make society better. Right. And so it really, it took off, but it also took off because it kept confirming things that people already thought they knew and believed in. Yeah. Because the people who yep. wrote these textbooks also believed those things. Um, so it was wildly racist, wildly ableist, um, often classist and various other, yes. um, a lot of things that we now know are absolutely based on people's circumstances were believed to be something inherent mm-hmm. yep. 
Yeah. People had long said that these things like criminality were inherent to someone's character. Now they were saying they're inherent to their physical makeup. Right. Society is like, how can science contribute to society? And science is like twirling its goatee. <laughs> and yes. being like, how can I further my own agenda? Absolutely. And that's exactly what happened, right? Mm-hmm. And eugenics was really mainstream within American medical schools and European medical schools Mm -hmm. in the early part of the 20th century. So the fact that, you know, you know people who studied under people who studied under eugenicists Mm -hmm. um, is probably the norm and not the aberration, except I think one of the things that's changing in society is that we're starting to acknowledge and look at. Yeah. Right. All right. Just how eugenicist was this particular person? Because yep. there has to be a, a cutoff on the scale here that we just <laughs> chop them. Right. All these people got to go. And let's not make that cutoff negative versus positive eugenicists. Right. Just just yeah. a general. Please no. That's yeah. not the cutoff and, line. <laughs> and I absolutely, as a historian, am passionate about looking at people in their historical context because mm-hmm. someone who is in medical school when all of their instructors are teaching eugenics they're in a very different position from someone who stumbles across it today and gets really excited about the idea and not that there aren't people who are being exposed to this by their teachers today but I do want to make sure that we look at people in their historical context yeah but also want to look at all people in the historical context you know people with congenital disabilities did not feel the same way as able-bodied people Right. But they were typically not able to attend those medical schools because of the structural ableism in place. Yeah. So they were not in the room talking about whether or not they should be alive. Yeah. Right. It's also, though, like if you're, let's say, you know, James Watson's age and you're 100 million years old <laughs> and you haven't changed those opinions. Right. I feel like you've you've had the opportunity to reevaluate how you were taught and and sometimes it's time to just you know be like well it's time to change but I do appreciate what you're saying totally uh, that it's very different from like a modern like a modern eugenicist that's a hard problem so how do you kind of Mm -hmm. as a historian how do you kind of you know finagle your distaste for some of these things with like what it was at the time that's a yeah that's a great question and I think that in talking about topics like these, I find it important to state where my own moral values lie, even when I'm talking about the facts of history, Mm -hmm. because they continue to do harm. These ideas continue to do harm. Yeah. Um, But when looking at, you know, writing about historical figures who are doing incredible amounts of harm, I try to focus on the harm they caused rather than who they were as people. Yeah. um, And look at what motivates them. And what motivates them might be racism, um, but it also might be a passion for their scientific career, that sort of thing. And I try not to get into the, was this person good or bad? It was, this person did a lot of really wonderful things and a lot of really awful things. And if we're going to look at them, we need to look at both. Yeah. And also look at their victims or the people fighting back against them or look at all of the different people in the equation. So the people who are attending that fair saying, all right, kids, we're going to go and go for the gold. And the people saying, all right, well, that fair is physically not safe for me because people like me get lynched there. Systems of power and oppression that privilege some racial groups over others um, that are happening in the literal same era. There's obviously an indirect connection there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Just looking at all of the people involved and their different relationships to the power structures is kind of the perspective that I try to take. Yeah, I I think you did a great job of that in the book. It comes across really well. Yeah. Thank you. I do want to tell one more story um, if we have time. We do, yeah. And this one is excellent. Um, And this one is actually from the same era as the Fitter Families Medal, but it's it's a much happier story. Um, And this is why I wanted to put a pin in that idea of um, if this medicine is happening at a carnival, it's probably bad. Um, so for <laughs> right. families is another example of uh, public health that's happening at a carnival that's bad. Although um, 
State fairs and things did also have information booths about not spreading tuberculosis. They had a lot of good things going on in the mm-hmm. progressive era. Again, this idea of science can make society better. Yeah. Um, but also in the early 20th century, late 19th to early 20th century, there were a couple of people in the United States who really wanted to get baby incubators to catch on. Some of those were doctors. Um, the field of obstetrics was kind of new because specializing that much was only a few generations old in that era. Uh-huh. Um, so there were a couple of obstetricians who were trying to get baby incubators to catch on for preterm babies, you know, babies who couldn't make it if they didn't have any medical help because they were born too early. And these doctors were theorizing that we have the technology to help them. We just need to apply it. Right. There was also um, a man named Dr. Martin Cooney, who the doctor was uh, a part of his name that he added himself. It was not, uh, <laughs> it was not because of a medical degree. Okay. <laughs> um, who was also passionate about ensuring that preterm babies had a chance to develop into, you know, healthy kids and adults. And he made a business of displaying baby incubators at carnivals, at world's fairs, at Coney Island. He recruited families to actually display their live preterm babies in these incubators because those incubators weren't available anywhere else yet. Yeah. You couldn't go to the hospital and have your baby cared for in an incubator there because your local hospital did not have a baby incubator. Mm -hmm. And so they would let this I don't know if sideshow is really the right word, but, (laughs) you know, carnival act, take care of these babies. Yeah. Um, He was not a doctor. He almost never had a doctor in his employ. He did have nurses, which I think is how the babies did so well. Yeah. And this is actually around the era when nurses started getting really good professional training, whereas before it had been largely something that you learned on the job. Which is crazy to me. Yes. Yes. Can you imagine? Yeah. Couldn't be me. Yeah. And it's, I think, the root of a lot of the negative stereotypes about nursing being just a caretaking role. I mean, caretaking is very important, but it's not a healthcare role. But a lot of the things that persist today right. were true in the 1840s. Um, and then about the 1870s, 1880s, that stopped being true. And nursing became this really important, yeah. um, trained medical healthcare role. Right. Um, and so some of those trained nurses were taking care of these babies. And it was the start of an ideological shift because many doctors at the time didn't believe that these babies could be saved. And so they weren't going to waste energy on something that they felt was just doomed. And especially, I think there's likely to be an emotional component there that you don't want to get invested in a three pound infant only to have them die on you three days later. Yeah. If you think that that's inevitable, that you're never going to save them. Right. It's not going to happen. Um, but between the doctors who were involved and Dr. Cooney, it did catch on. More and more doctors started to realize, yeah, no, this is possible. We actually can save preterm babies' lives and they can grow up to be completely healthy, indistinguishable from a full-term baby. And so that was a a huge, huge shift. I think 1930s or so was when it was pretty mainstream, but the shift kind of continued. Yeah. And then connecting it back to um, eugenics and scientific racism, I think the shift is still in progress towards if you can save a baby's life, but they're not going to grow up to be healthy, Mm. they're still worth saving. Yeah. Because their life is still worth living. Right. And so that's a shift that I think for some people is... Yeah, very much still in progress. And if you, you know, listen to disability activists, there are a lot of people who have faced a lot of abuse because people believe their lives aren't worth living. But sorry, I wanted to end on the happy note. And that happy note is baby incubators. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the incubator in my book is from the 1930s. It's from Nebraska. Cooney started in the US in Nebraska, although this is from later. So it's kind of two different snapshots. And I found a newspaper article, not about a baby who had been in Mm -hmm. the particular incubator in the book. The years are just a little bit wrong for it to be that incubator. So I found a couple of newspaper articles about this one girl. And one of them said that um, 
you know, with luck, she'll grow up to the, be the next Greta Garbo of Cass County. <laughs> and I just thought that was such a charming, hmm. um, extremely period way of putting yep. it. Uh, I later was able to look up um, her information. This is the wonderful thing about living in a time when so much has been digitized. Um, and I found that that, that girl uh, lived to age 63. Wow. Wow, what a cool story. Yeah. As you've studied all of these time periods, if you had a time machine, um, what would you go back and see first? Ooh, good question. Very good question. Um, so I have this really love-hate relationship with the progressive era mm -hmm. because so much of it was so idealistic and they were ideals that I largely agree with. And there was a lot that went wrong in that period. Um, and the progressive era is sort of the era following a lot of industrialization in the U.S. when um, a lot of both private groups and social movements and also public policy were aimed at um, fixing or making stop gaps in some of the societal ills of industrialization. So, hey, maybe child labor isn't so great, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. But there was a movement of public lectures um, where that was just a form of entertainment that people would go to, not limited to the progressive era, but that's some of the stories I've heard that I'm most interested in are from that era, um, where it was this idea of, oh, let's improve society with knowledge, not necessarily science, mm -hmm. but just knowledge. And it's not that we don't have that now. I mean, we have educational podcasts, we have TED Talks, we have all these sorts of things. Um, yeah. But there's just something about the way I see described people getting swept up in that, yes, let's go to a lecture as our form of entertainment. Yeah. That um, that's something that I would, would want to experience, even though, I mean, I do go to lectures at libraries and museums and things. So it's a, it's just the cultural phenomenon part yeah. that I think I'd want to see. Yeah. yeah. And that could be medical history or a medical topic at one of those lectures or not. You know, if I had a time machine, maybe my first impulse wouldn't be research but just fun <laughs> fair yeah we ask all of our um guests on the podcast this last question all right um and it is how do you take your coffee um very occasionally i'm a tea drinker <laughs> oh really i i do love coffee but i i love tea more um so typically black tea um as strong as i can find it um, typically Respect. kind of boring, like English or Irish breakfast, but very strong. When I do take my coffee, um, I prefer it black, but I often have it with a little milk because that's a little gentler on my stomach. Yeah. And the first time I said that out loud was kind of a, wow, I've hit adulthood. I prefer, prefer <laughs> black coffee, but it, it makes my stomach a little ooky. So that was like three different answers to your one question. <laughs> but we love that's it. That's perfect. Yeah. It's definitely a, a coming of age moment when you're like, oh, I have a specific way that I take my coffee. And if I change that up, it I'm going to feel bad. It messes <laughs> yeah. me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you've been so generous with your time, especially uh, with the re-recording of this episode. <laughs> your stories yeah. are incredible. Your book is amazing. We're so um, honored you. to have you as a guest on the show. Thank you for being here. Yeah. No, it was my pleasure. It was, it was a delight to have this interview. And um, yeah, thank you both so much. Thanks so much. Hey, Mal Pals, thanks for listening. The sources and links for this episode can be found in our show notes. If you haven't already, go follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Malpractice Podcast. You can also send topic suggestions, questions, or concerns to our email, malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. And just as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing, you should definitely subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget, malpractice makes perfect. Hey, yo, negative for Kobe. <laughs> Still Kobe. negative. What's up? That's because you got that boosty. I don't have the cove. <laughs> you know how they used to be like, oh, you have cooties. They're going to be like, when we're older, they're going to be like, you have COVID. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get your booster shot. You're disgusting. It's all our generation's children who yeah. are like having the cooties and 
It'll say circle, circle, dot, dot. Now I have yeah, you my, COVID my COVID shot. shot. <laughs> <laughs> circle, circle, square, square, boosty, boosty everywhere. Oh my God, I'm putting that in this episode. You can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't care. Okay, perfect. 